You're listening to a Mango Languages podcast. Language teaching is hard, but there are a lot of reasons to be optimistic. That's why we created this show, Teaching Languages Today, a podcast for world language educators about what's working and what's not. Listen in for the problems fellow teachers are facing, learn what solutions they found, and get some much needed self-care reminders of why you fell in love with teaching in the first place. Hi, I'm Emily, your host for the show. In each episode, I'll be taking you on a journey into seeing world language ed through a new lens by sitting down with an all-star lineup of teachers, administrators, parents, and students. It's my hope that the stories you hear in this show will get you thinking and feeling different about what you do in the classroom. Hello, my friends. Buongiorno. In today's episode of Teaching Languages, today we're talking about English language learners. And lucky us, we've got ESL specialist Brooke Batwell on the horn to help us make sense of things. Hello, Brooke. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Yeah, good, good. Welcome to the show. We're trying something new. Before we dive into the heart of today's episode, we're going to start off with a goofy warm up question. Are you ready? I think I'm as ready as I'm going to be. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. In the language learning space, ESL stands for what? English is a second language. Okay, great. The real question <laughs> is, first thing that comes to mind, what else could ESL stand for? Uh, okay, so there was um, a meme I saw on Pinterest one time, and it was, elephant securing a loan and it was an elephant at a bank and that's exactly that picture just popped into my mind as soon as you said that <laughs> elephant securing a loan that's that's perfect um so Brooke you and I struck up a friendship through social media back in the day and I like to think of us as kindred spirits um I love the content that you put out about ESL about teaching and all that to say I know who you are um but can you tell our viewers who you are, where you are, and what you do in language ed? Yeah, of course. Um, I am currently an English as a second language specialist in Virginia Beach. Um, I work in two different middle schools, but I am a military spouse, so I've also worked in New York and Texas. Um, I serve on the board of directors for the Virginia Association of Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages, and I'm our K-12 special interest group leader, so I do PDs and um, content for K-12 teachers. Additionally, I am almost done with my doctorate, and I'm doing that in education law and language policy. Wow, we're so lucky to have you on the show today. The story of today's episode starts in the past. So are you ready to embark on a little Mango Languages time machine? I hope so. (laughs) So I'll set the scene for us. So it's early 2000s, and an American teenage girl is sitting in a classroom in Austria. And a teacher is screaming at her in German for not knowing German. You were that girl. Can you tell us what happened and how it relates to how you think about language learning today? Um, So when I was in high school, I was actually 15. I fell in love with languages. So I was offered um, an opportunity to go live in Austria for a year. And, you know, I I had taken German in high school. I thought it was going to be fine. I get off the plane and I'm like, I'm not fine. (laughs) Um, And I was really kind of thrown to the wolves when I started school. There was no German as a second language program. Um, Their idea of supporting me academically as a 15 year old was to go down to the second grade German class and read stories with the second graders, which kind of, you know, as a teenager hurt my ego a little bit. (laughs) My intelligence was associated with my language abilities when I was there. Um, I remember my host mom saying to me, I told her, you know, when I you know, go back to the United States, I want to study international law. And she straight up told me, she laughed. She goes, you're not smart enough to do that. And she's like, you might want to think about doing something else. And now that I'm about to have my doctorate in education law, I kind of want to send her a message and be like, haha, I am smart. <laughs> but it all comes down to that association, right? We often link people's linguistic abilities with their intelligence. My mission and what I do is to kind of break that link and shift that mindset that multilingualism isn't a deficit. It's it's an asset. And we really need to embrace that asset-based mindset in the classroom. 
you work as an ESL specialist for, for two middle schools, right? Yes. And your day-to-day is split kind of between writing IEPs, so the individualized education plans, um, supporting students in acquiring academic English language, and also working with content area teachers like math, science, social studies to help them adapt their teaching strategies for English language learners. So I'd like to zoom in on those last two. Let's start with supporting students. First, How often do you recommend taking students out of the classroom for one-on-one language tutoring? This is a really tough question. (laughs) Um, So every state has their own guidelines for this. Um, If you're in a WIDA state, it it kind of um, has more opportunities for flexibility. Um, But for example, in New York, there's really strict um, state guidelines you have to follow where you have to pull them out for a certain amount of minutes. So definitely check your state and what um, even your district wants you to do. I personally am a full believer in immersion. Um, I believe in immersion programs. So I personally think the less time you pull them out of the classroom for instruction, the better. But that being said, you have to have an effective co-teaching model to do that. Um, So you have to have the time to plan with your content teacher Um, to actively be teaching and actively be a part of that lesson every day, which can be extremely challenging. I mean, you just read all the responsibilities that I do in a day, and that's across two schools. And I know some teachers are split between three, four schools. Some teachers, they're the only specialists in the district. So I, I know that sounds challenging, but in a perfect world, that would be what we do. But then you have, you know, we have two types of languages. We have basic interpersonal communication skills, which is like your playground language. Um, and then we have your cognitive academic language proficiency, which is the skills and the language you need to succeed in content classes and state exams. Um, so pulling kids out might be a good time to teach them that playground language, um, especially if the students are brand new, if they're newcomers, and they need to learn how to ask to go to the bathroom. They need to learn how to ask to call their parent, go to the nurse, all those things. You don't have time to do that in a content classroom. And it can embarrass them to have to learn those things in front of their peers, depending on their age and their home cultures. Um, so it definitely, pull out has its benefits. And I do think it's essential. But I am a firm believer that, that you know we learn language through content. That's the best way we can learn. Um, like I said with my example, I took how many years of German, and I thought it was okay, but I was like, um, I get into the airport, I can ask you where the bathroom is, I can ask you where the library is. <laughs> I think everybody who took high school Spanish can ask you where the library is. <laughs> Donde esta la biblioteca? Everybody can say that phrase, right? But then you go and sit down in an academic setting, and you don't have those skills, you don't have that vocabulary, but definitely check with what your school and what your state says you have to do. Brooke, you mentioned WIDA. Can you explain what WIDA is and if other states use something different than WIDA, what is it? So WIDA is a program that provides guidelines for ESL programs. Over 40 states are currently using it, as well as international organizations and federal programs use it. New York and Texas, which is where I come from, do not use WIDA. I'm going to be completely honest here. I love the New York program. We use something called CR Part 154. Um, That's been my favorite, and I often pull from that. Um, It just provides really clear-cut guidelines for exactly what kids need. So when I go down to um, our registrar, I can say, this kid legally needs this many minutes of push-in and this many minutes of pull-out in this content, and they have no choice but to do it where we kind of leaves it a little more open to what works for each state. But it, yeah, it's a program that provides guidelines for what um, an effective ESL program should be. Um, okay. Are you ready for our next question? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> what do you call students who are learning English? So like you, I'm sure our listeners have already noticed that I've used ELL, English language learner. I've used ESL, English as a second language. What do you use and, and why? Yeah, I, you know, my husband's in the military and when we try to out acronym each other, I don't, I don't think any of us win. It's terrible. Um, so when I first started in New York, we were ESL, ESOL teachers, English is, um, speakers of other languages. That's what we were. Um, and ironically, we called it ESOL in New York. And then I moved down South and it's ESOL and ESOL and people even pronounce the same acronym different ways. 
And then New York just recently switched to ENL, English is a new language, which I don't particularly like because we have a subsection of language learners. Um, we call them long-term English language learners. Um, so that kind of excludes them from the identification. Um, English is not new to them. So I don't really like that terminology either. In Virginia, my program, they call them English learners. We use ESL still, which really English as a second language isn't focused, again, on assets-based language. Sometimes English isn't our kids' second language. Sometimes they're fourth or fifth language. Um, and we really need to promote that as something that's good. So we're trying to find a term that really embodies all of our English learners. I also don't like English learner because I myself, you, Emily, you're an English learner. Um, so I prefer this, this newer term that we're starting to see more is a multilingual learner. Not only does it include our long-term learners, include our students who speak multiple languages, include our students with you know, interrupted education, it literally includes everybody, but it also includes social language and academic language. So really encompassing all types of literacy and all types of language and valuing it as equally important. But yeah, we have a lot, a lot of acronyms, <laughs> um, but I definitely, definitely prefer the term multilingual learner. And that's what I try to use most of the time. You know, one of the, one of the things that you do with your work is you support content area teachers in adapting lessons for their, their multilingual language learners. And, um, I'd like to shift us towards your work in that area now. So imagine for a moment that there's a science teacher who comes to you because they're struggling to get their ESL students to keep up with course content. So what strategies do you offer them and what have you found to be the most effective? Our teacher preparation programs don't prepare content teachers for having multilingual learners in their classrooms. And I think that's a huge disservice. Um, this is the fastest growing population in public schools is multilingual learners. Wait, hold up. Really? We're going to need to hear that one more time. The fastest growing population in public schools is multilingual learners. Our programs really need to catch up with, you know, the changing demographic and the changing population. So a lot of our content teachers, some of them have been teaching for 40 years, 30 years, and um, they've never had an English learner in their classroom. So they really don't know what to do. And that can be very daunting. It can be um, kind of scary if you, if, you know, you think you're a veteran teacher and, you know, you've done this for so long and then you're like, I, I have no idea what to do. Um, so what I like to do is when I um, have teachers who are brand new to teaching multilingual learners or are just really at a loss, I like to start with one or two strategies, not to overwhelm them, um, especially when you have a newcomer. Um, so someone who's brand new to the country Honestly, that social emotional piece is gonna be huge for the longest time. I'm getting them adjusted to the United States schools. They're not gonna learn content until they feel comfortable and safe in their environment. So even if they, you know, they have never heard English before, just smiling at them and encouraging them and making them feel like they're part of the classroom community is huge. And then once we have that relationship established and that relationship built, then we move on to the content. Honestly, the first thing you can do is using that home language support intentionally. One of my favorite things I like to do for my students with home language support is let them build background for things in their home language. Also, these strategies, a lot of people think, well, now I have to do all this prep and all this extra work. If you give a student, you know, a children's book in Spanish about, you know, George Washington, that's no prep on your part. Just email your library and see if you have one. Um, a lot of these can be really low prep. It's not as stressful as people think it might be. Um, and another easy one is making your learning visual. I'm a huge proponent and I say it all the time, talk less, show more. Again, gonna benefit all students, not just your multilingual learners. Um, and I think science is actually one of the easiest areas to do this. Science can be so hands-on. Um, you can stand there and have a lecture about something for 10 minutes and it might go right over the kid's head, you show them a four minute video of it happening and they're gonna get it. Um, and YouTube's great now with their closed captionings. Um, they can translate all those for you. So even if they're watching the video, they can have those closed captionings on in their home language. Um, but really making your learning visual through not only images, but multiple access points, right? So videos, graphs, charts, um, that's huge. So honestly, if you just start with, you know, 
purposefully introducing home language and showing kids how, how using their language is an asset, it's beneficial, and adding in visuals. Those are two really easy, really low prep strategies that are gonna keep kids engaged, make them feel like they're part of the community, and you're gonna see tremendous growth just by using those two strategies. Okay, so now we have home language support, make it visual. I know you have three others. Can you briefly tell us about those? Yes, my three other big ones, kind of going along with the home language support um, is when you have students writing, um, one of the first things I have them do, if they are brand new, I have them, we break down the prompt together, we go over it, um, and then I have them write their response in their home language. And then I say, okay, I want you to read through this and pick out all the words that you do know in English. Now write them in English. And it's a lot of words like I, me, for, and, those high frequency words, they know those for the most part. And then we take the words we don't know and um, you can have them use Google Translate, you can have them use bilingual dictionaries. I personally like to have them use their bilingual dictionaries because that's what they get to use on their state exams. So getting practice with those and they translate those words into their home language. And then you can modify that as they grow in their English proficiency. They might not need to write the whole thing in their home language at one point. They might be able to start writing in English, get to a word they don't know, write it in Spanish, and then go back. Mm. Um, but that's one way to get them to do it. Another way is um, providing them with sentence stems or sentence frames. So we all know thesis statements. People should have pets because X, Y, and Z. So you provide them with that initial people should have pets because, and then they fill in their reasoning. I want to stress this, <laughs> newcomers can write essays. They absolutely can. It's just about knowing how to give them the supports to do so. Um, my other two is the QSSSA strategy. The QSSSA, how many S's did I, did I just say seven S's or like two? I don't know. The QSSSA. It sounds like seven. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what does that one stand for? Yeah, it's question, signal, stem, share, assess. So it literally, and it gives you everything, right? So you have the prompts, then the students can participate. They can, you know, share either in a small group or you can share a whole group. And then it gives the teacher the opportunity to assess, okay, does a student not know the content or did they need more language support? Um, that was one of my biggest things when I was living in Austria. And even when I was living in Spain in college, um, I knew the answers in my head and I wanted to participate and I wanted to say things, but I didn't necessarily always know how to say it in the correct language. So I had the answer, I had the thought, right. I just didn't have the right words to express it. Um, so this strategy gives students those words and it gives them those supports to be able to participate in conversations. And then the last one is chunk and chew. And I love this for reading. So you read paragraph by paragraph, you pull out important vocabulary. Um, if you're in a place where you can talk about language, a sentence structure, and oh look, this sentence is a cause and effect sentence, things like that. Um, you really break down chunk by chunk by chunk and you chew it. Um, you go through each part to promote comprehension. I like to do this when students are reading short stories. I'll have them read a paragraph and then we write a quick you know, four or five word summary about what that paragraph was about. So then at the end, they have a summary in their own words about what that short story was. So when they go to do other activities with it, they have that to refer back to. So these are just my five favorite ones are the ones I use most of the time. And I really like these five because they can be used for all ages, all content areas, all levels of English proficiency, and they're very, very, very low stress on the teacher. You're not rewriting curriculum. You're not recreating everything because I, val I value my content teacher's time. So it's things that you can do that are easy for you, but make a huge impact to your students. This leads us into the third and final part of today's episode. We're gonna talk policy. So educational support for MLLs is so important, not just because it's the right thing to do or because as you mentioned, they're the largest growing population of learners in the US, but because there are federal laws that require we provide that support. So what are the main federal laws that teachers and admin should know about when it comes to MLLs? Um, so there are four big federal policies. 
The other three get their foundation in the first one, which is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That's where the equity conversation began. And that covers, you know, equity for all, not just English language learners. I just had a conversation with one of my registrars recently because a student was trying to enroll or trying to get them registered. She's like, well, we don't have a birth certificate. Like I, the parents say they were born here, which a majority of our multilingual learners are born here. Um, she's like, we, we just haven't gotten the birth certificate. I'm like, we don't need the birth certificate. She's like, what? I'm like, legally, by federal law, we do not have to have a child's birth certificate to enroll the student in school. We cannot deny students access to education based on their immigration status. We have other options, like they do need to provide other documentation, but it is not the birth certificate that we need. And that's the federal case, Plyler v. Doe. Um, so that's a huge one. If you have a lot of undocumented students coming into your school. Um, the other two have more to do with instruction. Um, the Lau v. Nichols case came in 1974, and um, that provided the precedent that all K-12 federal programs that are receiving federal funding have to provide instruction that meets the needs of English language learners. We can't just have them sitting in the class staring at the wall. Um, we can't put them in four periods of gym or art. Like they're entitled to the same quality of education as everyone else. And then later came the Castaneda v. Picard case, which gave us more um, guidelines on what an effective ESL program should be. So having the right resources, um, how we can evaluate programs and what programs need to have in order to be quote unquote effective. Knowing what we do have and knowing what we can use to fight for our kids and advocate for our kids is so important. Um, those are the federal cases. I suggest you look at your state law. Um, again, every, every state is so different. Knowing if you're a WIDA state and what WIDA says, if you're not WIDA, what's your program use? And just having that knowledge because you, at the end of the day, you are the ones who are there to fight for your kids and you need to have that knowledge to, to do so. I think that's so important for teachers to know because it is, it is hard if you're not, you know, you don't do law and you're like, I don't know what this, the school is not telling me that we need to offer these things. The state isn't even telling me you kind of have to self teach or listen to this podcast and find out what, really the federal law requires. And so having you walk us through that is so helpful, Brooke. Thank you. Yeah, and that's what I love about, you know, social media gets a bad rap. I love teacher social media. I learn so much every day from so many people. There's a lot of really intelligent, smart, talented people out there. Follow some of, you know, these people on social media because I, I learn a lot and you can learn a lot too, just from that. Well, speaking of following and liking, how can our listeners find you, Brooke, to continue the conversation? Um, I am on Twitter and on Instagram. I like to tailor my content towards supporting content teachers. But if you're new to ESL or you just like this field as much as I do, um, you can follow me. I am on Twitter um, at Boutwell Mrs. is my handle. And I am Miss Bilingual B on Instagram. Um, and we'll share all that information with you. Excellent. And to wrap us up today, what what are you the most hopeful for when it comes to ESL and multilingual learners? We have this mantra in my class, and I always start my year off with a unit, and it's um, we are multilingual. What is your superpower? And I genuinely like to instill that belief in my kids that being multilingual, speaking more than one language, is a superpower. Um, it's going to open up so many doors for you in the future. You know, your um, cognition, your um, communication skills, like everything is just so improved with the ability to speak more than one language. You understand more people. Um, you can travel more. There's just so many benefits. And we as a society don't take advantage of that. And that would be my one hope um, is to really start shifting the mindset towards bilingual is better. Um, multilingual is better. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep doing what you're doing. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Well, that was my conversation with ESL specialist Brooke Boutwell. And in listening back on this conversation, this episode really was a three, four, five of ESL. 
because we got the answers to three frequently asked questions about how we can support English language learners. We learned the four most important federal laws that every teacher and school district should know about. And perhaps most concretely, we got five really great go-to strategies that any content area teacher or ESL teacher could use to facilitate learning in the classroom. And I know what you're thinking. Emily, if only there were some downloadable PDF that I could have on hand that summarizes all of the key takeaways from today's episode, ideally in a visually pleasing way. Well, friend, I got you because my team and I here at Mango Languages have you covered. Just head to the description of this episode and we have that PDF linked for you. Voila! Well, that's all for us today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and language on. Ciao! This episode was hosted, produced, and edited by me, Dr. Emily Sabo. Our production manager is Dr. Erica Catregli. And our audience was... Oh, wait, that's you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>